a malevolent army led by a demon called Belial, wages a war against humanity. This army will fight several deadly battles, culminating in a decisive world war. Will God intervene? Or will the human race be swallowed by eternal night? For thousands of years, prophets around the world have predicted the end of days. More than one suggest the apocalypse is fast approaching. We call this theoretical convergence between doomsday prophecies and today's events the Nostradamus effect. In 1947, the Judean desert, in a remote, arid cave high above the Dead Sea, a nomadic shepherd discovers a cryptic scroll that describes a secret prophecy. It contains such mysterious phrases as Army of Belial and King of Ketim. Do these phrases foreshadow a moment when two forces, one light, the other dark, will confront each other in a final cataclysm? resulting in a nuclear World War III, and possibly the end of everything. Among the many discovered Dead Sea Scrolls is the so-called War Scroll with its prophecy of doom. But who is this message for? Written two millennia ago, the scroll was left behind amidst a war that would ravage Judaism and leave the rebuilt Solomon's Temple in ruins. The war scroll is the only existing first-hand account from a mysterious group of Jewish mystics who claim to know the events of the last great war. Their purpose of putting this together was to teach of a prophetic event, a yet future event. It's not surprising that groups today will go to the War Scroll and say, maybe it can teach us something. Maybe if we're able to line up the different stages of the battle with contemporary events, we would have kind of the key to unlocking these divine mysteries. We will examine whether those of us alive today are the intended audience for the War Scroll as this 2,000-year-old document spells out in chilling detail the end of the world. Does the prophecy contained within the War Scroll converge with other texts in the Old and New Testament? Is it similar to doomsday prophecies in other cultures? And are current events similar to those described in the scroll, suggesting that this might be the past actually revealing the future? One more example of the Nostradamus effect. Understanding the War Scroll's possible link to today's unrest means delving into the ancient origins of the Dead Sea Scrolls and exploring their discovery in the Judean desert. The Dead Sea Scrolls were a group of documents found in 1947 near the Dead Sea, hence the name. They were found in a cave by a young Bedouin goat herd, or so the story goes. The scrolls are a collection of handwritten biblical texts that took up to 200 years to write. Collectively, they contain fragments of nearly the entire Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament. Archaeologists ultimately discovered 10 more caves nearby containing nearly 900 animal skin and papyrus documents in sealed jars. The scrolls are important because they are a closer approximation of the original source material of parts of the Hebrew Bible. When we look at the origins of, say, Christianity, we're dealing with the gospel. They've been manipulated, they've been translated. They don't give us honest history. They give us an interpretation of history. The Dead Sea Scrolls issued directly from the group of people who constructed them, who wrote them. And to that extent, they give us the direct link to their beliefs and to a certain amount, their history. Written perhaps between 170 BC and 68 AD, 
The scrolls are believed to be all that remain of a small Jewish sect that lived in a settlement at Qumran, a plateau in the Judean desert along the Dead Sea, 12 miles east of Jerusalem. The sect is known as the Essenes. That means that they lived in the time that both rabbinic Judaism and the community surrounding Jesus that eventually became the church were being formed. So in that respect, this is just an extraordinary finding. You actually have authentic handwritten texts from a community living at this time. Some scholars believe the Essenes authored the scrolls, but who were they? Kind of an extreme Jewish group that felt that they needed to withdraw and not mix with the rest of society in order to keep themselves religiously pure. They did that because they were not pleased with what they were seeing in their society and thinking that it had gone awry and did not want to participate in that part of society that they felt was no longer right with God. According to some scholars, the Essenes believed the Jewish people had angered God by not living according to Hebrew scriptures, that they were too secular and humanistic, and that this was why God had allowed invaders such as the Romans to conquer the Jewish homeland. The Essenes were led by a charismatic leader they called the Teacher of Righteousness. He is credited with having really brought the group together, given it direction. He was a very charismatic leader who was given the ability by God to properly interpret scripture, and the faithful of that movement then agreed with his interpretation of scripture. Some historians believe that this teacher of righteousness was a member of the Zadokites, a set of Jewish priests who were ousted by the Romans. The Essenes believed that the Zadokites were the rightful high priests of the sacred Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Though some say the Essenes led a peaceful communal life, others consider them an apocalyptic cult. People think that the Essenes, what they've heard of, are peace-loving, retiring, apolitical, meditative. That is not the group that wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. You have to define them by what the scrolls say. Well, the scrolls are not peace-loving, the scrolls are not meditative, the scrolls are apocalyptic, militant, and aggressive. Interpreters of the scrolls suggest that a belief in a coming apocalypse may have inspired the Essenes to create the War Scroll, which they believe to be an ancient blueprint on the art of war. But could it also be interpreted as a prophecy of a future Armageddon? Evidence may lie in the War Scrolls text, which lays out a framework for a violent confrontation between two opposing forces. The opening lines of the text read, The first attack of the Sons of Light shall be undertaken against the forces of the Sons of Darkness. Some War Scroll scholars believe the Essenes were referring to themselves when they described the Sons of Light. They called themselves the community of the Renewed Covenant. The Sons of Light therefore include those who are true in their understanding of scripture and their application of scripture. But some also see parallels between the Essenes and certain devout practitioners of the Jewish faith today. The Jewish people have traditionally viewed themselves collectively as the people that represent that mission of representing light in terms of spiritual light and values. But the scroll also emphasizes a mysterious group called the Sons of Darkness, who will engage the Sons of Light in battle. Are these the forces of evil who have turned their backs on God? Referring to the Sons of Darkness, the text says, Supporting them are those who have violated the covenant. The Sons of Darkness, as described in the War Scroll, also include the violators of the covenant. And that terminology brings us to a very interesting aspect of this kind of apocalyptic worldview, which is that there are enemies from without, but you also have to be careful of the enemies within. In order to understand who the Sons of Darkness would be today, we have to look at the Essenes' understanding of the violators of the covenant who were people who had fallen away from God but who claimed to be religious. 
According to some scholars, the Essenes identified the Sons of Darkness as Jewish people who had spurned strict Judaic practice, known as Levitical law, and those who lacked morals. According to the initial author of the War Scroll, these people are also part of the Children of Darkness, kind of like traitors. But does evidence support relying on the War Scroll to identify Sons of Darkness and Sons of Light in modern times? History may provide a clue. In 37 BC, after hundreds of years of domination by the Persians and Greeks, Jerusalem found itself under occupation once more, this time by the Romans. There is a new enemy to react to, and so Rome now governs and places people on the Judean throne, such as Herod the Great, who was not Jewish, and as a result offends Jewish sentiment, certainly offended the sentiment of those who embraced the war scroll. The people who wrote these texts hated the Romans. They hated being dominated by a foreign invading force. The Romans were pagan overlords because they insisted that they have sacrifices to the Roman emperor in the Jewish temple. They also insisted on tax being paid to Rome. They also had a lot of practices which the staunch Jews considered unclean and immoral. In 66 AD, militant Jewish groups rose up in revolt against the Romans, but they were ultimately slaughtered. And in 70 AD, their holy site, the rebuilt Temple of Solomon, was destroyed. Historians believe that in the midst of Jerusalem's destruction, the Romans advanced on the Dead Sea area as well. Pliny was the general who conquered that area because it had to be conquered. And there were some extremist groups out there who had more militaristic intentions. Caught up with them was the group at the Dead Sea, the people who wrote those scrolls. Before meeting their final destiny, the Essenes left a grim prophecy about mankind's annihilation. Some have identified similarities between the violence exacted against the Essenes and modern calamity in our own time. Clues point to this forgotten location in the Middle East. Is this ground zero for a coming apocalypse? The Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. Among these ancient texts is a prophecy of the ultimate battle between good and evil. The forces of light and darkness. The War Scroll. Some interpreters suggest it foretells World War III in our time. The reality that's seen in the scroll is one that they expected it to happen. If we believe in the reality of the biblical text when it speaks, then this must be fulfilled in the future. According to some experts, these scrolls, 900 strong, depict the violent time the Essenes endured and survived under Roman rule. Historians point out that the Roman legions were largely motivated by greed and the enrichment of their rulers in Rome. And there are legions today who are similarly greedy for money and power. The whole purpose of power is to get money. The whole reason to have all the money is to have the power. The power and the money and the money and the power, all synonymous terms. And so this is also revealed in the Sons of Darkness. The War Scroll indicates that its authors, the Essenes, hated those who demonstrated greed, and they portrayed the Sons of Darkness with this trait. For they are a wicked congregation. Their strength is as smoke that vanishes. Every creature of greed shall wither quickly away like a flower at harvest time. According to some scholars, the War Scroll suggests that so-called darkness, the evil enemy of all good people, is without morals and guided by greed. In the War Scroll, the Sons of Darkness's immoral and greedy leader has a name. Belial. 
Cursed is Belial for his contentious purpose, and accursed for his reprehensible rule. And cursed are all the spirits of his lot for their wicked purpose. War Scroll talks about the Sons of Darkness, and they are those who follow a celestial figure whose name is Belial, simply a name of Satan. Belial is their word for the devil. Different words are the same in all Christianity, Judaism, and Islam for Diablo, Belial, and so on. When Belial is used, it's a contraction, actually, of two Hebrew words, Beli and Ya'al. Beli, Ya'al. But we say in English, Belial. Beli is the Hebrew word for to waste or consume something, and to take it and absorb it and waste it and consume it. And Ya'al is the Hebrew word for profit. Is this another direct link between ancient perceptions and today's events? Those that are involved in manipulating money, those who are overtaxing people, corrupt politicians, global financiers who are taking advantage of the poor, trying to make themselves rich, they could all be legitimately classified as sons of darkness who are breaking God's law, who are attempting to make themselves wealthy at the expense of others. Some people are comparing the son of darkness with people who control global finance and greed and have put us in the current situation. There's a connection. Evil can come in many, many forms. And we know that economic instability can trigger all kinds of very difficult things in the world. It can trigger violence, it can trigger wars. Some question whether the demonic Belial is upon us in the form of today's fallen Wall Street executives. The economic collapse of 2008 is one of America's pivotal events of the last decade. The repercussions were felt worldwide, with severe financial consequences that nearly led the world into a second Great Depression. Threats to the world don't necessarily have to be physical threats in terms of violence. The economics can lead to tremendous problems and instability. So the notion of an arch enemy of good that not only is physically powerful, but also economically and politically powerful could certainly be put into the context of this idea of the sons of darkness and could pose a tremendous threat, not just to the Jewish people, but to the stability of the entire world. If we accept this theory as true, should we logically expect a financial annihilation to occur in our lifetime? Annihilation, when you say that word, a mushroom cloud comes to people's minds and everything being blown up. But that's only one way to annihilate a nation. If you decimate the economy of a nation, you annihilate it. <laughs> For believers, economic woes are perhaps only one sign that the world may be spinning out of control. Some experts note the similarities between the war scroll and apocalyptic texts of the Bible, such as the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a kind of Christian version of these apocalyptic Dead Sea Scrolls. You can't prize them apart. You have to see them as being connected in some way. When you read the book of Revelation, you see a lot of the same characters, plagues and stuff going on. As a matter of fact, you have trumpets and seals and bowls, and in the war scroll, you have these same kind of things going on have a cosmic conflict between good and evil, between God and ultimately the devil. It's the same in Revelation. In the Battle of Armageddon, God himself intervenes, he crushes evil, and then there's a new heaven and a new earth, and good and love ultimately win. All of those themes are shared between the War Scroll and the Book of Revelation. Some scholars also see a convergence between the earlier War Scroll and doomsday prophecies of the more commonly accepted Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament. There are other influences from the book of Daniel, the book of Zechariah, which mention battles, and particularly Daniel, which mentions that in the last days, Michael, the archangel, will stand with Israel and oppose those who come against Israel. And so that kind of pattern is enlarged in the War Scroll, showing that angels will fight a heavenly battle alongside the sons of light. But others debate whether there is any connection at all. 
and there's no direct relationship between Armageddon and the War Scroll. It's just that both of them lived in a time period of religious oppression. Still, if the prophecies of the Hebrew Bible, Book of Revelation, and War Scroll converge, each predicting similar fates for mankind, is it mere coincidence or something more? Perhaps a repeated warning. Is a storm brewing today, a storm of evil, gathering its forces and echoing across these ancient texts? The War Scroll points to many forces making up the Sons of Darkness, and for some who believe in the prophecy, the ancient text predicts the exact spot where a third world war may erupt. The War Scroll, a violent tale of powerful forces battling for control of the world. Some believe it is a blueprint for Armageddon, of a 21st century war to end all wars. But can a 2,000 year old document written by an ancient cult predict the end of the world in our time? What evidence exists to confirm that this prophecy may be converging with modern events? The War Scroll describes a future battle an eschatological battle, in other words, a battle that has to do with the end of days, with kind of the final battle of good versus evil. Believers say the text of the War Scroll is explicit about from where the enemy will emerge and see it as a clue about who they are. They shall fight against Mesopotamia. They shall fight against all the sons of Assyria and Persia. These lands are inhabited by people today many of whom are hostile to the religious beliefs of the ancient Essenes and their modern counterparts. Even now, religious strife thrives throughout the region. Mesopotamia is just a general term used to describe that area east of Jerusalem today. It would be all those countries in general that are east of Israel. Assyria, of course, is Iraq, and Persia, of course, is modern-day Iran. So as you can see, these are all involved in latter days events, and that happens to be exactly what's going on in our world right now. Do these areas represent the past, present, and future enemies of the Sons of Light? What is the correlation between those ancient lands and today? Part of the problem is we're not exactly sure what those regions are. And obviously, the geopolitical realities of the world today are very different from those in the biblical times. Has the War Scroll prophecy predicted the apocalypse will emanate from this same region, an area in which Christians, the Jewish people, and Muslims have clashed for over 2,000 years? The Middle East is at the center of human civilization and has always been at the center of great conflict between these great civilizations. You have three religions that each believe they have the final say on what God's message is to mankind. And you can't reconcile that no matter how you try. And then you have two of those religions that live right on top of each other in the Middle East. Some believe this conflict of civilizations extended to the West on September 11, 2001 when New York City's World Trade Center Twin Towers were targeted in a terrorist suicide mission using hijacked airplanes as missiles. There had already been several attacks. For about the past 50, 60 years, there had been trouble with militant Islam in Europe and in the Middle East, but America had always been protected from those kind of terrorist attacks. And so we suddenly joined the rest of the world in 9-11, that we suddenly realized there was this problem going on. Nobody had experienced anything close to 9-11. Not even Israel, for example, which has had to deal with terrorism from its inception. No one has ever had to deal with an attack that took close to 3,000 people's lives, destroyed massive buildings, caused a lot of economic damage over a long period of time. Following the September 11th attacks, conflict between the U.S. and Middle East dramatically escalated. The events of 9-11 led to wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, 
wars that are spreading into ancillary regions. There are several major conflicts going on simultaneously in the Middle East. There are several different struggles for power and position and control. You have the Iran-Iraq struggle, which now transformed into Iran becoming a superpower for the area, and the Arab countries in general fearing for an imbalance in power, and maybe that might lead to a nuclear arms race in the region. Iran, occupying the region referred to in the war scroll as Persia, has been a center of conflict in the Persian Gulf for years, with a deeply conservative Muslim government actively hostile to the state of Israel. Iran does play a very significant role now in the Middle East, and with the prospect of Iran developing nuclear weapons, this puts some of the other Arab states in a precarious position. Believers in prophecy suggest it's more than mere coincidence that the very lands mentioned in the war scroll, Mesopotamia, Assyria, and Persia, are the same lands now engulfed in conflict. Those who believe the war scroll prophecy may converge with current events also believe there are signs that Satan haunts the tumultuous Middle East. Down throughout history, there have been battles between those who are trying to control and to take over and to advance through conquest and those that are trying to defend their freedoms. And I think that we're seeing similar conflicts today in our world. But others suggest that religious conflict, particularly in the Holy Lands, is simply a discouraging but typical aspect of the human condition. What other evidence exists that the war scroll is a true work of prophecy? According to the scroll, seven great battles will take place, culminating in the end of days. For some scholars, six of those battles may have already occurred, setting the stage for the ultimate conflict of good versus evil. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the only texts that remain from the ancient library of an apocalyptic Jewish cult, the Essenes. One in particular, the War Scroll, is considered by experts to be a blueprint for Armageddon. Some suggest the message in this ancient scroll may be converging with present-day events. The War Scroll is part of a bigger apocalyptic end of day scenario, which certainly is part of the Jewish worldview of how history will unfold. And of course, the Christian world has picked up on that. But I think the real issue is the actual chronology. Some believe the Essenes were convinced they would live to see the apocalypse. But commonly accepted Jewish belief spoke of a 6,000 year span between Adam, the first man, and the arrival of a messiah who triggers Armageddon. Most believers in Judaism at the time thought they were only 4,000 years along on this timeline toward Armageddon. Were the Essenes working on a different timeline, perhaps worked out by a learned teacher among them? This really refers to the teacher of righteousness who knows all the mysteries of the words of the prophets. So in other words, the teacher of righteousness is one who is able to read and understand scripture and understand exactly how those ancient prophecies are now coming true, are being fulfilled in their own time and place. According to the scroll, the Essenes believed that the final war would include the return of all the Jewish tribes to the Holy Land. The sons of Levi, the sons of Judah, and the sons of Benjamin shall fight against all their troops when the exiles of the sons of light return from the wilderness of the peoples to camp in the wilderness of Jerusalem. In this aspect, the war scroll and more widely accepted biblical texts are in sync. 
The Bible very clearly teaches that in the end of days, there's going to be a gathering of the tribes of Israel in the latter days, and the enemy is going to gather against that, of course, in the first century BC. Well, there's no 12 tribes of Israel in the land of Judea. There's basically the three that are listed as part of the sons of light, and that is Levi, Judah, and Benjamin. If the war scroll is indeed accurate, its prediction surrounding the return by the Jewish people to Israel aligns with apocalyptic texts in the Bible. Believers point to two events in the 20th century that indicate the prophecy of the Jewish people returning to the Holy Land. Primarily in 1917, Britain took control of Palestine. In the Balfour Declaration, they invited Jews from all over the world back to Israel. This began, according to many fundamentalist Christians, the last days or final judgment of mankind, as described in the Bible. There are some elements in Israeli society that have the ethos of this final apocalyptic days mentality, and a lot of evangelicals and fundamentalists in our world that we're familiar with have a similar mindset, and they see the foundation of the state of Israel as stepping stones to this final apocalyptic situation. On May 14, 1948, the state of Israel was established, but its Arab neighbors would not recognize it. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq all attacked the next day starting a bloody year-long war, the first of many. The Arabs had been committed to the idea that the creation of a Jewish state was unfair and unjust, and that there shouldn't be a Jewish state in the region. So they went to war to try to prevent it, to strangle it basically at birth, and try to prevent it from being created. The Israelis ended up winning that war. For some, this series of battles clearly mark the beginning of the final fulfillment of the War Scroll, which speaks of six battles in which the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness clash before the final showdown. Three times the Sons of Light triumph, but not ultimately, they just are victorious at that moment, but can't really win. Three times the Sons of Darkness triumph, but also not enough to vanquish the Sons of Light. Could the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 be the first of these battles? Believers in this theory suggest four other Arab-Israeli wars were also predicted in the war scroll. But what of the ancient Essenes? Some believers argue that the ancient cults saw their own demise as the first battle between lightness and darkness. These writers of these scrolls clearly understood that these things could possibly happen during their immediate lifetime because the Romans were persecuting them. Skeptics of the war scroll prophecy suggest the Essenes simply predicted their own downfall and not one of future generations. These apocalyptic groups in Israel fermented strife during the first century AD. And it culminated in this absolutely immense and disastrous war against the Romans, which began in 66 AD. The apocalyptic groups, the Essenes, if you like, were totally defeated. Those who weren't killed fled into Egypt where they were captured, tortured to death. Others were captured by the Romans and died in the various arenas up the coast of Palestine or even back in Rome. They were wiped out completely. If we accept that six of the seven battles noted in the war scroll may have already occurred, when might the final battle take place? And against whom? Is the war scroll simply an ancient manual that outlines military strategy? Or is it, as some suggest, a prophetic vision of a third world war? According to believers in the war scroll, the apocalyptic prophecy written by an ancient Jewish cult 2,000 years ago 
may be converging with current events. In the end, it could be a very painful and difficult process, and no one can be sure who's going to be around to see the end of the story. The scenario is a very scary one. In a funny way, we can say that the motivation of the people who wrote the War Scroll are very, very similar to the motivation of people today who are expecting a Battle of Armageddon in the Middle East at any moment. And that can only be considered very, very dangerous because the belief systems we hold affects our behavior. And if we believe something to be true, and if we believe something is going to happen, the chances are we might actually cause it to do so. The authors of the War Scroll, the Essenes, believed a future war will be led by a satanic figure known as Belial, who will be joined by the immoral and those who have turned their backs on God. Some interpretations of the War Scroll suggest the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness have been locked in battles since the time of Jesus. But some experts wonder whether the scroll's relevance in today's world can even be determined. It's very open in terms of the text itself. What you have are the people who think they're on the side of right and the people who they think are the enemies of right. What I'm trying to say here is that when people employ the War Scroll for modern day political discussions, it tells us more about their own ideology than about what it says in the War Scroll. For those who see literal meaning in the document's text, they consider modern Israelis as the direct descendants of the original Sons of Light. They point to passages such as, for the God of Israel has called out a sword against all the nations, and by the holy ones of his people he will do mightily. Jewish people have always viewed themselves as having this very unique mission of being a nation whose job it is to elevate the entire world, to rid the world of evil, and to bring the world back to the ideal spiritual state it was before everything fell apart, back to the Garden of Eden, so to speak. Similar to Essenes, some devout practitioners of the Jewish faith today have interpreted the Hebrew Bible and its laws as strictly divine or transmitted by God, especially regarding prophecy related to the coming of the Messiah. They claim this Bible and the prophecy of the War Scroll both point to the establishment of the State of Israel as a sign of the end times. They also point to another prophecy that may very well lead to Armageddon. There is today in Israel a small community that is driven by a kind of messianic fervor and wants to reestablish the Third Temple, believing that that is a step in the messianic process, that eventually that is what will bring the Messiah and the end of days. This is, of course, a very problematic issue because Right now, that is the site of a Muslim mosque, and you can imagine it's a very complicated issue. That site, where the Temple of Solomon, the most sacred site in all Judaism, once stood over 2,500 years ago, is on Jerusalem's Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is very significant for the Jewish people because that's where, according to their tradition, Abraham went to sacrifice his son. It's also where David built the first temple. And in the temple, you had the Ark of the Covenant, which had the Holy of Holies. The only place on earth where the Spirit of God actually was on earth. So there could be no place holier for the Jewish people than the Temple Mount. The Islamic faith also holds the Temple Mount as sacred. Referred to as the Noble Sanctuary by Muslims, the Temple Mount is the third holiest site in Islam. According to the Quran, the prophet Muhammad traveled to Jerusalem in the 7th century AD and ascended to heaven from the Temple Mount. On that spot today stands the Al-Aqsa Mosque, as well as the Dome of the Rock, completed in 691 AD. The site is layered with overlapping beliefs and long-standing grievances. Israel has at least physical possession of 
the Temple Mount. Even though legally it's a little more complicated, they've ceded that. They've ceded legal authority to the Muslim religious authorities. But at least the kind of technical possibility, logistically, Israel could say, well, we want to go ahead and build a temple. So that has raised the level of engagement, the level of involvement among these groups, trying to push for actually something happening. But there's more. Some fundamentalist Christians believe that rebuilding Solomon's temple will hasten Jesus' return. So they too are lobbying for its construction. There are some members of the evangelical community in the United States who are supportive of this, believing, of course, that that Messianic Jewish group has everything right except for the identity of the Messiah. Now, how they actually expect this to occur is anybody's guess, because I think the meaning of jihad will be finally apparent if they try to destroy the buildings on the Temple Mount. The Muslim world would undoubtedly be up in arms if the current Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque were destroyed and a Jewish temple was built in its place. It would be Armageddon. The Dome of the Rock, Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the site where the Temple of Solomon once stood. Each elicits extraordinary passion in those who consider this place sacred above all others. Some fear that fanatical believers of the war scroll may become emboldened to take a critical step, rebuild the third temple, and according to their belief, trigger the battle of the sons of lightness and the sons of darkness. The great hand of God shall overcome Belial and all the angels of his dominion. That wickedness be overcome without a remnant. There shall be no survivors of all the sons of darkness. Those who have researched the war scroll say there is some logic to the belief that it and other doomsday prophecies may be converging. They theorize that the Middle East remains a crossroads of civilization and the battlefield of Armageddon. According to the War Scroll, the heavens open, the sword of God comes down, Michael comes down, the archangel, to lead the sons of light. At some point, God would intervene, defeat the enemy by a non-human sword, whatever that meant. And so they leave it very cryptic in there to allow God to intervene in any way that he so chose. What could this non-human sword be? Some powerful weapon that only God wields? some unexplainable tool of divine intervention, nobody knows for sure. At the end of time, we have the return of the Messiah in Islam, in Judaism, and Christianity. Now, whether these three messiahs are the same person or whether there are three different messiahs who then have to fight it out, no one knows. But the fact remains that this huge battle which is talked about in texts, if it's believed in, and if these beliefs inform the lives of those who believe it, then who's to say that it won't occur? The future is, as yet, unwritten. But perhaps it is forecast on parchment weathered by 2,000 years of desert and sea. Regardless, humankind pauses once more to consider its fate. Just another day, or perhaps the very last. Our answers remain shrouded within the Nostradamus effect.